the landscape is shifting. So for example, like in, you know, 19, the interesting number I looked at recently, in 1996, real estate investment trusts, so these organizations that are set up to hold real estate and can effectively sell shares of themselves as a pure investment vehicle, own 0% of rental housing stock across the country. Uh, they now own 20 to 30% of it. So what we sort of start to see in terms of like people individually investing in housing, like obviously that has been a, an attractive investment for a long time uh, and has gotten attractive as sort of rents have risen, mm. um, is also becoming attractive to these institutional players. And when you see large scale real estate investment trusts investing, it does kind of change the dynamic of sort of who the landlord is. So, you know, someone who's renting out their basement suite to a tenant, you know, in that situation, you know, we can talk about how likely that owner, you know, probably is forced into that situation because they don't have the money to buy the house outright, right? We have seen the, the ballooning real estate costs and the ballooning costs of owning of any kind of housing mean that people are sort of forced into these situations. And really, that becomes a it can often becomes a complex interpersonal relationship. You know, we hear from a lot of tenants who have great relationships. And we hear from a lot where you know a personal relationship goes sour, and that suddenly threatens their actual their home and their housing and the security they feel to be able to have a place to live. Right. Um, in terms of when you have a larger organization, something like a real estate investment trust that's going around and generally not building new buildings, but buying up existing stock right, and right. trying to get a bigger stranglehold on the market, mm -hmm. you see instead sort of carefully calculated strategies to maximize the return on investment. I think for every landlord, you know, even a landlord that wants to be, that is doing their best to be a, you know, a good landlord and a good person to their tenant, right? In the back of their mind, there's always the knowledge that, you know, this is some, an investment vehicle, investment on which they want to make money, but they can make the choice, right? To accept less, less rent than they possibly could, uh, to cut tenants slack where they, where they can. Something like a real estate investment trust is not only less likely, very far less likely to do than any other kind of landlord, they're probably not even really, you know, there's a great incentive on their board of directors, for example, to deliver consistent profits for their shareholders. So you take the regular profit motivation of housing and you turn it into overdrive for these mm -hmm. organizations. Um, so that's, that's one huge risk. Um, I think as well, when we talk about sort of what kind of housing we're building and how to get back to a place where people have, can we can sort of realize an actual human right to housing in Canada. Um, you know, the provincial government in Canada has stated that's something that, 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 that something they recognize, a human right to housing. Uh, the federal housing advocate has stated that's essentially something that we need to do in this country is to take steps to realize that. The last time we had anything close to that, we were so for much further ahead in terms of public investment in housing. When the taps were turned off from investing in public housing in the, in the early 90s, since then we have seen a slow and steady slide into increasing unaffordability as you know once the government stopped providing sort of a baseline of housing um, amount of social public so, uh, and sort of affordable housing you know the market takes over and the market only seeks profit so that's okay. you know a primary reason why rents are, are spiking up so much uh, over you know, the consistently over that period of time